Welcome to my PhD dissertation defense. Um, I'm Eric Nusassian from the Department of Informatics. Uh, the title of my dissertation is Impact of User Traversal on Performance of STEM Learners in Immersive Virtual Environments. My advisors are Dr. Michael Lee and Dr. Margarita Vinikov. And my committee members are Dr. Frank Bioka, Dr. Salam Daher, and Dr. Hannah Kuhn. Yoka. So thank you, committee members, for getting me through this process. So on the agenda today, I'm just covering the, the major chapters in my dissertation, as shown here. Uh, my research focused on AR VR technology for STEM education. Uh, the primary software that we used for, for our experiments, uh, we built myself and my team in the mixer lab, and we called it Cspresso. Uh, motivation for this research was the fact that emerging technologies of augmented and virtual reality uh, may have vast implications to societal communication and representation of information. Uh, similar to the introduction of the personal computer and the internet, AR, VR may open up new forms of information visualization, manipulation, and communication. So this may be especially impactful in the education and the productivity of STEM professionals, as research shows that simulations and visualizations improve STEM learner performance and engagement. Uh, but data modeling and, and programming complexity of STEM professionals are growing in, in their fields and are becoming more computationally heavy. Uh, Air VR interfaces may become necessary in the STEM fields to manage the higher levels of sensory processing, cognition, and, and decision-making capabilities required to interact with these more complex computer systems and data sets. Monitor-based interfaces may be replaced by AR VR interfaces as user interactions, interactions may require three dimensions to increase uh, information bandwidth between the users and their computer systems. So monitor-based educational technologies uh, like uh, simulations, animations, and video games have been well explored as uh, STEM learning environments. Um, while AR VR um, ed tech is still in its infancy, they, it does show a, a strong inclination towards education or improving education, collaboration, and productivity. Uh, AR VR tech has the potential to increase learner immersion, allowing the user to interact directly with the simulation and focus on the information that's presented to them. Learners using educational technologies, such as websites, interactive simulations, and educational video games have shown improvements in abstract reasoning, spatial cognition, and multitasking abilities compared to traditional educational media, like textbooks, illustrations, and videos. So these abilities are essential for modern educational approaches, and this has even led the United States Office of Educational Technology to call for the integration of immersive technologies into our public schools. Uh, current pedagogical methods of in-person and textbook instruction will need to be supplemented, especially for students entering STEM fields, as they're more likely to be engaged with these higher-end technologies. Examining ARVR's impact on STEM education through the fields of learning science and human-computer interaction allow for a unique understanding of how these emerging technologies will impact our knowledge-based society. Identifying STEM educational use cases of, uh, for ARVR technology may help scope research efforts, improve technological efficacy, uh, especially since there's a lack of research into ARVR as a learning environment for widespread educational applications. Uh, and, and virtual reality is a, an excellent starting point to investigate design frameworks that can be generalized to the wider range of ARVR headsets. Current wireless VR headsets are an affordable self-contained medium to conduct HCI research where results can then be generalized and to identify best practices for AR, VR as a general computing platform. 
So the, the goals of this dissertation would then be to help define this understudied area of AR VR use cases in STEM education. Uh, this dissertation will examine one fundamental AR VR interface capability, um, environmental traversal, and its impact on learner performance. AR VR is, is currently the only computer interface which affords the user this type of environmental traversal capability. And since it's a relatively new research area, little is, little is known on how environmental traversal will impact uh, user learning performance in these AR VR um, virtual learning environments. So it's important to compare different environmental traversal interactions across and within uh, AR, VR, and other learning mediums to see if there is an impact. Um, across learning mediums, um, for example, that would be looking at live instruction uh, versus uh, using an AR, VR educational technology. And within the learning medium of AR, VR, we might look at varying different types of interactions, in this case, varying uh, different traversal methods and styles. So the goal of educational technology is, is not to replace live instruction, uh, but to ensure that comparable alternative learning opportunities are available when live instruction needs to be supplemented to keep the learning potential high for the student. Uh, ARVR is currently the only educational technology that, that offers this, this type of environmental traversal and interacting with, with 3D objects laid out in a spatial way. So it's important to compare AR VR against live instruction with and without the user ability to traverse the environment since learning scenarios in the in the real world um, might have the learner in either a stationary or, or non-stationary position. Now, the first goal of this dissertation is to understand the efficacy of AR VR against live instruction with the user within the AR VR headset, their ability to traverse um, without them to be able to traverse the environment. Now, this is because that the common learning arrangement for a student is to be in a stationary position. So it would be important to understand how a non-traversable AR VR learning environment impacts user performance compared to a similar uh, stationary situation in a physical learning environment. Uh, as a supplemental educational technology, non-traversable AR, VR, uh, would, its efficacy would need to be verified and it would need to be understood um, how it impacts a user's perceptions of their learning material. Uh, the second goal of this dissertation is to understand the efficacy of AR, VR against live instruction. Now with the AR, VR users uh, allowed to traverse their environment. And although that it's uh, common for students to be in a stationary position while seating, uh, that's not always the case. Um, in fact, it might be necessary to allow a learner in a physical uh, environment with live instruction to be able to move throughout the learning environment to help them learn the subject matter. It, it, it would be important to understand how a traversable ARVR learning environment impacts user performance and compare this to the stationary physical learning environment. Uh, and again, as a supplemental educational technology, the, the efficacy of a traversable ARVR environment would need to be verified. It would need to be understood how traversing an environment instead of being stationary in the, the physical environment in a traditional manner, how does moving, how does that help support the learning performance? And so then the third and final goal of this dissertation is to understand the impact of varying the method of this traversal interaction available within the AR VR interface. Um, although it's common for students to be in a stationary position, you know, that's again, that's not universal. Um, in fact, yeah, I can think of situations like physical lab experiments where students are actually required to be mobile. They must move around the lab table and they must interact with the equipment to finish the, 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 the lab exercise and, and to learn the material. So as a supplemental educational technology, the efficacy of a traversable AR, VR environment would need to be verified 
on different varying um, impacts on the, the user's uh, traversal of the virtual environment. So these different styles and types of traversal methods uh, would need to be examined and how their impacts to the user performance and their usability preferences would need to be understood. Since this is an initial exploration into this domain, into studying these traversal interactions and in ARVR interfaces, uh, we, I'm looking at a straightforward test. It involves comparing the most natural traversal method available within the ARVR interface against a more limited form of the same traversal method. So this would look like, uh, this could be one user, one, one group um, is allowed to naturally walk through the virtual environment exactly as they would in their physical environment, compared against another group where their traversal method would be that they're still moving throughout the environment, but they're using a controller pad or a game pad while they're standing still to move the environment around them. Uh, the, the, when we first, or when I first started doing these studies, uh, the limited amount of software options in AR, VR educational technology restricted uh, the ability to conduct these in-depth studies on user, user traversal factors. Um, the, so the first study of the, um, used off-the-shelf software in a non-traversable environment, um, but the following studies in expanding these research questions out into um, a spatial traversal meant that I had to build uh, custom prototypes within our lab to test these user interactions. So the immersive uh, virtual learning environments that we used in the second and the third studies were designed to teach the introductory computer science topics, binary counting, and the bubble sorting algorithm to computer science novices. Uh, the educational technology built in the prototyping process, uh, we ended up calling CSpresso, uh, the CS in the beginning for computer science, and Expresso, like a um, a very rapid and fun and active way of learning the material. And it's designed for students to learn at their own pace in an effort to have them internalize the concepts that, to produce measurable learning outcomes. Uh, the prototype was designed to simulate uh, learning experiences, uh, situations usually found in physical learning environments and aiming it to increase engagement in measurable uh, teaching concepts in, in STEM to a wide range of learners, just as effectively as they would in a physical environment. So now the related works that were reviewed for this dissertation uh, looked at prevailing theories and models of human cognition in the fields of educational psychology, learning science, human factors, and human computer interaction. Uh, this review of human cognitive models uh, was necessary to identify areas of research that may offer insights into effectively designing for AR VR educational technology. In addition, reviewing the current state of technology use cases in STEM education, mostly focused on monitor based edu um, educational technologies, really helped to identify learning challenges that were appropriate uh, for AR VR interfaces. So many psychologists used Pizet's theory of cognitive development in Vygotsky's social cultural perspective as, as frameworks for cognitive development. Uh, for this dissertation, I'll focus on uh, Piaget's theories. Uh, so he argued that human cognitive processes change slowly but drastically over time as humans make sense of the world around them. Uh, he looked, he identified four factors that uh, impacted these cognitive processes, biological maturity, activity, social experiences, and equilibration. And then these factors really pushed toward uh, two thought processes that, that he focused on, organization and adaptation. So organization refers to the, the constant combining and rearranging of behaviors and thoughts into coherent systems which is what most people would think of as the, our educational system. Uh, adaptation refers to the adjustment of behaviors and thoughts to the environment, uh, which indicates that environmental factors may be an important consideration for both physical and, and virtual learning environments. And, and this really 
led to the uh, fundamental constructivist principles that, that learners are active in constructing their knowledge. And this is really what's central to modern design of, of STEM pedagogy and educational technology. Now, it's important when designing for a new 3D interaction technique that we must consider the human factors that affect its usability and performance metrics. So for proper evaluation, it's important to have a basic knowledge of how users process information into useful interactions. A user action model that has been designed specifically for 3D user interfaces is the user system loop. Um, and it's a system oriented adaptation of Norman's seven stages of action. Now, when a user interacts with the system, they perceive the information that are coming from the, the sources, the output from the system. They process, the users process that information in various forms and decide to take actions that they, um, from the information that are made on them. Uh, the system based on these these interactions through the input devices system will return information back to the user as they receive feedback on their actions and this starts a new cycle on the information processing loop. So this is similar to how a teacher would build this type of information processing loop in their classrooms interactions for effective learning of their students. Now, designers of AR VR educational technology need to be keenly aware of how the, the virtual learning environment is interacting with the user with this type of feedback loop. So recently, um, embodied cognition has become more prevalent in learning science. Uh, it's a theory that the way we think and represent information reflects the fact that we need to interact with the world that the interactions we have with the world around us uh, perceived our senses and our bodies affect our thinking. Uh, this would mean that the human's cognitive processes are, are deeply connected with our, our body's interactions with the world, and that cognition depends on these sensory motor experiences. So an example of this would be observational learning, where watching a person demonstrate a skill activates the areas of the brain that would be involved in acting that skill themselves. And it's very similar to the effect um, on the brain if you were to actually learn that skill directly. So observational learning and other embodied cognitive learning scaffolds are highly relevant to the proper physical environment, the participants and the objects that are required to engage with these learning methods. So this is um, great for uh, opportunity for AR VR educational technology because it's well suited as an alternative to these type of uh, embodied cognitive teaching methods when the proper physical requirements are, are hard to meet. And uh, a very important topic in this regard in the human computer interaction field is embodied interaction. It's uh, defined as interaction with computer systems that occupy our physical world and that they exploit the fact, this fact in how they interact with us. So embodied interaction takes advantage of a user's familiarity with the real world, including interactions with physical objects and artifacts. Uh, it's the creation and the manipulation and, and sharing of meaning through active and sustained interaction with these embodied phenomena that is what's called embodied interaction. Uh, so this theory is the starting framework to understand how to incorporate 3D user interfaces in AR, VR, ed tech to apply embodied cognitive learning pr uh, principles and methods uh, such as observational learning. And that um, AR, VR, ed tech could be designed to simulate these sensory motor experiences that a, a learner would have while using their body to learn about the world around them uh, and to encourage user to interact and explore the, the virtual environment that's presented to them. So um, issues with contextualizing, effectively demonstrating and, and visualizing class materials, a constant concern for STEM educators, and it's characterized as a disconnect between the student's perspectives 
in the pedagogical frameworks of the topic. When used properly, lab work improves overall learning outcomes, it positively affects student engagement, and it contextualizes the material. Yet there are challenges to overcome with implementing physical lab work, including safety and cost concerns that point to educational technologies as a solution. A large body of work supporting the effectiveness of physical lab work as a tool for learning STEM uh, topics already exist, as in, well as another large body of work supporting monitor-based educational technologies to virtualize aspects of these physical lab work and still maintain these labs uh, effectiveness. <clears throat> so while AR VR educational technology is not reviewed heavily in this regard, the current literature suggests that virtualizing physical lab work may be a primary use case for future AR VR technologies in the STEM fields. And uh, in addition, what, what research does exist indicates that ARVR learning environments can promote discussion of ideas between learners uh, with enhanced uh, spatial and, and visual explanations of abstract topics supported by user environmental exploration and interactions that are not easily reproduced in physical environments. This uh, lack of uh, research with um, AR, VR educational tools as a, as a learning environment um, means that it's important to examine its impact on STEM education through the fields of learning science and human computer interaction, as it may allow for a unique understanding of how these emerging technologies will impact our, our knowledge based society. So, to address this research gap, this dissertation, examined uh, a fundamental AR VR interface capability, uh, the ability to traverse a virtual environment and looked at its impact upon learning. So the first study of this dissertation compares the performance of STEM learners uh, in a physical learning environment and a virtual learning environment, both with no environmental traversal abilities. The second study of the dissertation uh, compared the performance of STEM learners uh, stationary in a physical environment against STEM learners that are mobile in a virtual environment. So physical, no traversal versus virtual with traversal. Now the final study then compare the performance of STEM learners using the same virtual environment, the same AR, VR, ed tech, spatial interface, and only altered the environmental traversal between the two groups. Again, one with a natural walk and one stood still using the hand controller to move through the environment. So study one. Comparing the performance of STEM learners in a physical and a virtual environment, both with no environmental traversal. This study examined that um, whether STEM learners uh, gain the same benefits to their academic performance, regardless of whether they received collaboration training in a physical or a virtual environment. We looked at learning community training for undergraduate. STEM students. Learning community training is socialization, collaboration training. Uh, it explores the effects of a non-traversable immersive virtual environment um, on these students learning collaboration skills. Uh, these are important skill sets for learners entering a new professional environment, whether it's academia or industry, uh, because it's these social support networks that will be vital to their survival. Now, collaboration training is a suitable medium to compare virtual and physical treatments without environmental traversal uh, for either groups, uh, because most collaboration and socialization is done where the individuals are in a stationary manner. So our research questions, how does a non-traversable immersive virtual learning environment impact learning performance? 
Is it just as effective as an in-person instruction? And how does the actual virtualization versus physical uh, impact the learner perceptions? So we had three groups, the control group had um, their freshman year as is, no additional training. We had our physical treatment group, had additional learning community training in a physical format and a virtual treatment that had it through virtual reality software, separating the participants uh, 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 location-wise. And um, so you can see the collaboration, the assessments that the groups had. So these were recruited um, from incoming freshmen. Um, they were randomized into the groups. Um, these are exclusive groups um, and their incentive um, uh, uh, to complete the study was $150. So implementation. Um, on the left, you can see a, a group of four in the virtual treatment uh, doing a collaboration activity in the VR software. On the right hand side is what the physical group same size of four look like doing an activity similar spacing between the participants similar size table and activities are on the table so the activities were aligned that whatever interactions you had in, in virtual you have to have in, in physical and we worked with the freshman year seminar director to develop this curriculum uh, the treatment subgroups were of four because that's the max that you could fit into the vr software which was facebook spaces the interactions that are available in that space are um, your voice, um, your body uh, poses and movements, uh, the use of a pen that draws in 3D space, uh, playing cards, dice, and any 3D models you wish to import into the package. Uh, the students met for eight weeks of training out of a 15-week fall semester. And for each of those weeks, they met one hour during the common hours. The curriculum that both the treatment groups received of the eight weeks are listed on the left. Um, the virtual treatment lagged behind the physical treatment by one week because that first week they had to be introduced to the VR software as their first activity. These activities revolved around philosophical arguments, um, uh, group, group, uh, group work and decision making activities logic puzzles, um, and fun ice-breaking games. So Pictionary and Charades are the fun games. Um, the, the, the philosophical group decision-making situations are Lost at Sea and Ship of Theseus, and, and the students you see at the right are actually going through the Lost at Sea activity. So the um, assessments that we had the the participants do, all the participants for these assessments, including control. Once a week, they had to fill out a social metric. As you can see on the left, um, the, a, they had to fill out um, the names of students that they had academic socialization with and what class it was in relation to. Now, we looked bi-directionally. We said, if you gave a student five minutes of help outside class time for the week, that means you had academic interaction with them, socialization. And if they helped you for at least five minutes a week outside class time, then that was academic socialization. And we looked at the directions of each, uh, each socialization interaction. On the right hand side, these uh, academic performances were done about once a month. We did we lined them up with the Common Core exams, which were three times during the semester, in addition to the final exam at the end of the semester. So four data points. And um, this they had to fill this out for each of their Common Core classes of the science and engineering. And it was a self-reported metric um, given a week before the exam to not give them anxiety on their performance. Um, at the end of the semester, we interviewed the two treatment groups. Uh, the protocol that we followed was a one-hour semi-structured interview. 
Um, we had 26 from the virtual group, 19 from the physical, total 45. The interview questionnaire was about 23 questions long, all dealing about questions on how the treatment impacted their opinions of collaboration. Some examples were, which activity did you like the most? Were you likely to give help or ask for help or receive it? We followed the three-stage coding process. Uh, defined by Campbell for intercoder reliability, where you're supposed to achieve at least 87% uh, reliability minimum. We achieved 88%. We found 52 codes uh, and grouped them into 10 themes, counted them up, and created uh, histograms and insert categorical data. Um, the results in this case dealing with the academic difference between the treatments and the control. So these are self-reported semester grades, one being F up to five being A. And this is ordinal count data. It's not normally distributed, unpaired groups. So we used a Mann-Whitney test. And we see here that we have uh, that both um, treatments have statistically significant higher grades compared to the control. At the top, you see the physical treatment compared to control, and at the bottom, it's showing a statistical significance between the virtual and the control. And then looking at the social assessment, assessment differences from virtual and control, um, we looked at both the total and the directional sums of the social interactions. This is discrete data. It's not normally distributed. These are unmatched groups. So we use the chi-squared test. And we see here that the virtual treatment gave statistically significant more help compared to the control. Now moving on to the interview data. So uh, this is showing one theme. Remember I was saying that there were 10 themes that were um, um, uh, with our two review, our two researchers that went through the interview process, uh, review process, we found um, uh, 10 themes. This one is an interesting one to report on. The perception of roles in collaboration. So we have the virtual group in blue, the physical group in orange. And what's interesting to see here is that um, the virtual group, um, they got their treatment through virtual reality, seem to report higher on that their perceptions of their roles had to deal with a natural role of collaborating, and that is more focused on their ability when they collaborate. Whereas the physical group was reporting higher on being a follower. So we see that. Um, virtual treatment may have positive impacts on user perceptions on leadership roles i'm more natural and more it's more of my ability to collaborate as opposed to being a follower this theme is uh, about motivations behind collaboration and we can see here that the physical group is reporting on a code more about um, sharing of ideas. So my motivations behind collaboration were about sharing my ideas from the physical treatment. And the virtual treatment is reporting more on a sharing their workload and helping. So we see a difference here on the group functions, their opinions of what the group is supposed to do in a collaboration. I'm supposed to share my workload. I'm supposed to help from the virtual treatment. In the physical treatment is about sharing of ideas. So the first study of this dissertation uh, compared the performance of STEM learners within a physical and a virtual learning environment, both with no traversal capabilities. Uh, the learners in the physical uh, treatment were seated during their experience. The learners in the virtual um, had the preference to sit or stand, but they could not move as their interface surrounded them in their reaching distance. Um, we saw that the STEM students, no matter what the treatment, physical or virtual, had improvements or statistically significant improvements to their academic performance compared to the control, and that the virtual treatment um, offered, and we saw a statistically significant difference in how much 
help they offered their peers in informal social settings compared to the control. And based on our interview data, we saw that the, the virtual training may impact uh, perceptions in a positive manner toward uh, leadership roles and group performances. So the evidence for this study suggests that instructional delivery in a virtual environment with no traversal capabilities um, of the, the spatial AR interface offers comparable learning efficacies to the physical treatment, physical environment. So the second study of the dissertation compares the performance of learning in a physical environment in a stationary position against learning in a virtual environment requiring environmental traversal across the spatial AR interface. Um, this study explores the effects of this traversable virtual learning environment against the, the, the stationary physical. Um, the, the sessions were at a, a summer computer science camp for middle school children. And um, the curriculum there was using constructivist learning, active learning techniques for computer science. Uh, this lesson that involved the experiment happened to be on binary counting with an active learning activity from CS Unplugged. It's a very popular uh, teaching method that uh, focuses on teaching computational thinking without using computers to CS students. So since both the physical and the virtual learning activities um, were using the same active learning scenario um, and that we've already compared stationary uh, virtual learning environments to stationary physical learning environments, then this is a, a suitable medium to compare the virtual uh, and the physical learning environments while varying the traversal interaction between the two. So our, our research questions are, how does this traversable immersive virtual learning environment impact learning performance? Is it as effective as in-person physical instruction? And how does this learning uh, in, a, in this traversable virtual environment impact engagement and usability factors for the learner? So in this study, uh, we had 34, uh, summer camp students, 19 girls, 15 boys, all from fifth to eighth grade in middle school. They were randomly assigned into a control and a treatment. The control was live instruction. The treatment was the virtual learning environment. These are exclusive groups. And this is the gymnasium here where we did our testing for the virtual treatment. And each user was guaranteed at least 20 by 20 of empty space, 20 by 20 feet of empty space to roam about. And you will see in a minute um, why that was important with the system. So um, the participants started in the center of this 20 by 20 space. They spawned into this world, this virtual space. And you can see that there's these task stations surrounding them and you don't go past this green boundary. So in, a, in, a, in effect, it was a circle, this external wall boundary, a circle of a diameter of 20 feet. So the player starts in the middle, guided through a tutorial to approach the task station, get a task, set your, your parameters and your number, color, and shape station, which then you generate output and give it to the task station to hopefully solve the task correctly. If not, you have to repeat through and change your parameters on the number, color, and shape station. Here's what the user uh, saw in the virtual reality headset. Uh, there's no audio. And so these are the visuals. This is the number station. Um, this was the low fidelity uh, prototype, just using cubes and basic colors, really focusing on the UX design. And um, here's there's, there's three levers, um, each are powers of two. You add them up, you count them for binary math. And then there's a little chart on the side and there's an interactive um, a display at the top which shows them what they're counting up to. So the task might say to get seven red cubes and you have to go to each station and set the right numbers to show that you understand the binary counting. Now this is the high fidelity version. Afterward, we got feedback from the users. We went back, 
we said that the UX cycles were good. We refined them a little bit based on the feedback, and then we put all our effort in refining the graphics and the animation. So the implementation of this study. On the left, we got the control, and on the right, the treatment. So that all the students went through a pre-assessment, um, uh, learning, uh, see what they knew of binary counting beforehand, went through the training session con with control with the physical activity on the left, and the virtual treatment on the right it lasted about 20 minutes. Uh, the virtual treatment needed to be trained on how to do the equipment first. Then we had post assessment um, of the learning assessment. And then we had an interview for the virtual treatment. And get this activity on both is coming from CS Unplugged. So computational thinking without using a computer. Um, here's our learning assessments. So these are also coming from CS Unplugged. At the top is um, the questions at the top are directly related to learning material uh, from the, the training exercise. At the bottom, these questions are um, a step removed. Uh, the symbols are different and they're seeing if there's a transfer of knowledge. So can you still do counting, understanding of what's on, what's off, what's one, what's zero with a different symbol set other than what you were shown? Uh, so the interviews, 30-minute uh, semi-structured group interviews were conducted for the treatment group. Uh, 15 questions, most questions mostly dealing with their opinions on collaboration. These were focus groups of five children because um, we did five subgroups in the virtual treatment and then we pulled them into focus groups with these usability questions. Did you like to move? Did you like to do it while you were learning? Did you need to stop for any reason? We used a three-stage coding process defined by Campbell for inner coder reliability. Um, I read the, the open-ended questions, uh, responses, uh, generated a list of codes I thought were relevant and then had a second researcher review those 10 responses um, until we reached a minimum of 87% reliability, we got 91%. And then we coded the remaining responses and counted them up. So the results for this, um, here we have our learning assessments on the left is a comparison of the pre-assessments from the control to the treatment. Um, and we found no statistically significant difference between them. And on the right, as a little typo there, it should be post-assessment uh, between the control and treatment. We see that learning did happen. They could answer more questions, uh, but there was no statistically significant difference between the two. So they both learned as well, physical and virtual. And I could even say physical stationary and virtual with traversal. So this dis discrete data, it's not normally distributed. These are unpaired groups. So we used Wilcoxian rank sum test with alpha at 0 0.01. Here's our interview data. Um, in this case of the themes that we generated, we found that this one based on user emotions was interesting to report on. So here we have five codes, total of 36 counts. Um, and we see on the left-hand side are three positive emotions, our codes related to positive emotions, and they're reported much higher than the ones on the right, which are negative emotions. So we have a much higher reporting of enjoyment, enjoying immersion, physical activity, than feeling bored and distracted. Um, the positive numbers were reported at 33%, 30.5%, 25% from left to right, and the negatives are at 5.6%. So the key points this is a second study of dissertation. It compares the performance of STEM learners in a, a stationary physical environment against STEM learners in a traversable virtual environment. The virtual learning environment presented binary counting in a, in a gamified, engaging manner. Uh, students were observed verbally walking through the, the tasks and dancing when they solved the problems. Uh, the treatment learned binary counting in a virtual way, just as well as the control did in a physical way. Evidence from this study suggests that instructional delivery in a virtual environment with required traversal of the ARVR interface offers comparable learning experiences to the physical equivalent 
with the stationary position. So now the, the final study, which compared the performance of STEM learners using the same virtual learning environment um, in virtual reality, but alters the environmental traversal ability between the two groups. One standing still using a game controller to move around the environment on the left, and the other group using a natural walking method free to roam on the right. So we examine uh, the um, interaction of traversal kinematics in an AR VR interface and how it impacts learning performance and usability metrics um, of the participants. So we're looking at analyzing traversal types as interaction fidelities within the user system loop framework. Um, and within that, we're looking at the biomechanical symmetry of body movements reproduced during an interaction technique. So this means when you reproduce a technique, a, a movement, a task that's done in the physical world, and you reproduce it in the virtual world, what type of symmetry of the body parts and body movements are? How much are you recreating the physical task into the virtual? So the sub-symmetries of that are anthropometric symmetry, which is involved in mirroring the body parts. So if you're walking in the virtual world, are you still using those same legs in all parts of the, the, the leg in walking? And then kinematic symmetry is focused on body motion. How much of it are you recreating for the interaction? So if you are walking, how much of are you moving your legs to actually walk? So some related work on this study. Um, first off, what, um, what type of research has been done on traversal tasks um, and our learning with what, well, in regards to a traversal of the user in AR, VR educational technologies? So th there was some research done um, dealing with traversing of, of complex locations and navigations and for uh, industrial workers and facilities. There was a lot of navigation and traversal studies done for improving a naval officer focus on navigating ships and getting around their ship. Um, but there really was no research on how traversal in a virtual environment can impact just general learning performance or in particular for learning objectives such as STEM education for the user. Um, and continuing the literature review, uh, we're seeing what type of traversal techniques have been reviewed. Um, so we saw, or I found a few studies that examined the basics of traversal in, um, in, in AR VR headsets and the psychological factors involved, uh, exploration and travel inquiry. Um, they looked at the theory of behind uh, user traversal and built a framework based on a natural walking style and a hand controller based uh, walking style. And this is the basis for the, the walking styles that we use in our studies. Um, there was also a study on, on presence in virtual environments determined by the style of traversal. So there's a more of a, a natural walking style using a Wii balance board and a connect sensor, um, and then against the game controller based walking. And they examined um, how do these two different traversal styles impact the sense of presence for the user? Um, and they found that the more natural method uh, actually gave a stronger sense of presence. And that's interesting to look at, like, can we make use of this in a learning environment? So we're going to look at how does the traversal kinematics of a immersive virtual learning environment impact learner performance? Um, how does it impact, and in particular, how does it impact learning, retention, task time completion, as well as usability? So um, in, this, in this study, we have a control and a treatment. Each had 25 participants for a total of 50. They were uh, recruited voluntarily from our IT201 classes. They were exclusive groups. Um, the control group is, was assigned partial traversal or using a gamepad to move because 
that is more common today than actually walking through a virtual environment. So that was given to the experiment group. And this is what the partial traversal looks like. So using the gamepad, you're moving the list, the three-dimensional list that you're going to sort around you as you stand still, but that gives you the feeling that you're moving through the environment because the whole environment moves along. And then the full traversal is when you are walking, the, the participant is walking through the list with their feet and legs, and it's giving that natural style of walking, everything else is stationary. Now, the design goal of this virtual learning environment is to take advantage of the Oculus Quest free roaming feature. It's wireless, you can roam around the environment, usually up to about 20 by 20 feet. Um, we had a waist high station that grows lengthwise um, based on the size of the list that you need to sort. An interactive console in front of the user gives directions, it sorts elements, and allows you to traverse the list. So notice how the console moves to the right, and you can only have two elements on that console at a time, and those are what you can swap. And we get to the end of the list, it moves to the front. And then we have directions, guidance, and hints in the UI behind it. Uh, there's also a 2D representation list on the board. So in case the 3D is confusing, um, you can look at the 2D list at the base um, to help you sort the list. Uh, there were visual elements, uh, no auditory, uh, um, yeah, auditory elements for the stimuli. Uh, we had a tutorial, seven tasks, and it took about 13 to 30 minutes for the users to complete. So the tutorial started with a list of three elements, and it grew up to a list of eight elements. Um, and to to show that that list came in complexity to see if they understood they were able to process these longer lists. Uh, in the setup, we had a, a big empty room in the lab, 20 foot by six feet per subject. So usually the subjects were moving left and right. So they didn't need a full room. They just needed a nice long corridor to move back and forth between. Had no physical obstacles. I had to train them and fit them with the VR equipment, instruct them whether they were to walk or use the game controller and then instruct them on how to push their virtual hands through the virtual buttons. So in the procedure, we had our pre-assessment, our consent form, a demographic, a knowledge assessment. We went through equipment and procedure training. We had uh, the, the session, the training session lasting 13, uh, 15, 30 minutes, and then a post-assessment of our our knowledge assessment, emotion sickness questionnaire, and usability questionnaire. And then retention was done one day, one week, one month later with the same knowledge assessment done remotely. This is what the knowledge or the learning assessment looked like, um, taken from uh, professional training websites, Geeks for Geeks and Pro Profs. Uh, you can notice that the multiple choice questions get longer so we start with a list of three and we move up to a list of six mimicking the way that they learned and they had to show all the intermediate or they had to select the intermediate steps that were all correct to sort to bubble sort the list um, now the usability assessment um these are um Likert scale questions we had 16 in total a general usability section of eight questions, a spatial awareness section of four questions, and a presence uh, section of, of four questions. Each section had a open-ended, please explain your thoughts further question that we used uh, as, a, a quali um, as a qualitative um, review afterward. So hopefully the, the qualitative questions might show something in the, the um, um the open-end questions can maybe give us some insight into what they were thinking when they answered that so right the the liker type questions gathered the quant data the open-ended followed up with the qual data so we used three-stage coding process defined by campbell for inner code reliability i read the open-ended responses generate a list of codes another researcher reviewed 10 percent of the responses um, and we reached 89% past the 87% minimum. 
we coded up the remaining responses, counted them up, um, and created our histograms. So for the results, this graph shows the mean scores between the two treatments for their pre-assessment, post-assessment, and their retentions. So this gives us kind of a general idea of what was happening. Uh, the pre-assessment, you see that the treatment was a little bit lower, but in general, both um, had low scores. After, at the post-assessment, both scores were much higher. The, the treatment um, had a stronger delta than the condition. And the retention pretty much stayed, stayed very strong, uh, longer lasting than, um, than I would have expected it to. So what do we see? Um, after analyzing this is that we actually did find a um, statistically significant difference on the pre and post deltas between the virtual and the condition uh, the virtual treatment and the condition and the um and the control sorry that's a typo on the graph um so the treatment actually learned better, had a, a statistically significant improvement in their learning after the um, session. So this is discrete data. It's not normally distributed. These are unpaired groups. We used Wilcoxian rank sum of an alpha of 0 0.01, and treatment did statistically significant better than the control. So here we have the task time differences between the conditions. Um, and sorry, at the bottom, that's the blue is treatment and orange is control. So we have six tasks here, and these are the number of seconds it takes to complete them with the little black bars being the standard errors. Um, and what we see is that um, both groups are relatively quick to finish one, two, and three tasks, and then the, the time really grows. It, it had to deal with the, they were probably getting fatigued and the list is getting much longer to complete. Uh, but we did find that's interesting is that for tasks one and two, the treatment did statistically significantly better or quicker to solve the tasks than the control group. Uh, for the rest of the tasks, there was no statistically significant difference. And this is continuous data. It's not normally distributed, unpaired groups. So we used the non parametric man Whitney test. Uh, for usability differences, um, of all those uh, quant questions, those uh, Likert scale questions, we found that one had a statistically significant difference. So it was a question how did you enjoy moving your body while learning? Now, the treatment group had a statistically significant higher score than the control group. And this is ordinal count data, not normally distributed, unpaired groups, and we use non-parametric Mann-Whitney test. Now, to follow up on that quantitative Likert scale question, we looked at that open-ended response. Can you explain your 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 op, your um your responses more, right? And so here's the codes that, that came out of that. And the interesting ones are, are on the right-hand side. So um, the code of, I enjoyed the embodied cognition. I, I enjoyed moving while I was learning. Um, we see that the treatment reported that seven to one compared to the control. And we see that a, there's a kind of a, a much higher motion sickness difference as well that the condition was reporting that the treatment wasn't. All right, so the, the final study of the dissertation compares the performance of STEM learners using the same virtual learning environment, but alters the, the traversal ability between the two groups. Uh, it compares the efficacy of a natural walking traversal method to a hand controller based traversal method on learning performance for the participants. It was shown that the more embodied traversal of natural walking across a spatial AR-VR interface does have an impact 
on the learn of the technology's learning efficacy. And evidence from this study uh, suggests that the more embodied traversal interaction of natural walking may offer better learning usability and, and task time performance to its users. So in summary, this dissertation presented several examples of, of AirVR educational technology studies involving learners from primary and undergraduate STEM education. Each study found interesting learning and usability considerations while examining different STEM topics uh, with different kinematic symmetries of environmental traversal. And this led to the final identification of learning and usability impacts of the kinematic symmetry of these environmental traversals for one STEM learning task. Now, further studies would need to investigate a, a higher fidelity of these kinematic symmetries for these uh, traversal techniques. And we have to look at a larger spectrum of learning topics uh, to, gener to generalize if this, this not gained um, is applicable to, to, to broader areas of AR, VR, and the HCI and educational technology fields. So in summary, um, we found that the, the first study compared STEM learners in a physical environment and a virtual learning environment, both with no traversal capabilities. Um, that both treatments had statistically uh, significant improved academic performance, regardless of their learning community training, whether it be physical or virtual, compared to the control, which had no learning community training. And we found that the virtual treatment gave statistically significant more academic help to peers in social settings compared to the control. And that the virtual treatment um, training may actually impact positively uh, perceptions on leadership roles and group functions. So evidence from this study suggests that instructional delivery in a virtual environment with no traversal of the AR VR interface offers comparable learning efficacy to the physical environment. The second study compared the performances of STEM learners in a stationary position in a physical environment against STEM learners in a virtual environment that allowed them to traverse the AR VR interface. Now that the virtual learning environment um, presented uh, the learning in a gamified and fun manner and the treatment uh, participants learn binary counting virtually just as well as the control with live instruction and evidence from this study suggests that the instructional delivery in a virtual environment with required traversal of the air barrier interface offers comparable learning experiences to physical equivalent with a stationary position Now, once it was shown that um, both with and without user traversal, that AR, VR computer interfaces uh, are, have a comparable efficacy against uh, their traditional um, physical environments, the third study looked at how to alter the user traversal ability um, within the same virtual learning environment and look at its impact on user learning. It was shown that the more embodied traversal of natural walking across the spatial AR VR interface may have strong impact on the technology's learning efficacy. Evidence from this study suggests that the, the more embodied traversal interaction of natural walking may offer better learning, usability, and task time performances to users, since that's where we saw the uh, statistically significant differences. And this dissertation offers evidence that the ARVR technologies with and without user traversal are suitable STEM learning environments. And additionally, providing higher levels of traversal capabilities may increase learning task time and usability performance. Now I'm going to conclude uh, with the novel contributions of my work. So during the course of this dissertation, I developed and released new learning community curriculum for virtual learning environments. And I identified novel benefits for socializing within virtual learning environments. 
I design new interaction techniques based on embodiment theories from learning sciences and human computer interaction for virtual learning environments. I identified novel benefits for interaction techniques for learner performance in these virtual learning environments, in addition to novel benefits of these virtual learning environments to secondary and collegiate STEM students. And this all wrapped up in the development and the release of computer science educational software on the Oculus Quest virtual reality system. So thank you for taking the time to listen to my defense. I would like to thank my advisors, Michael and Rita. It's been a long effort doing this all, much appreciated. Thank you to all the teammates uh, who helped me along the way, in particular, Jessica, Adam, Shannon, Jerry, Brent, Chris, and Namita, and especially thank you committee members.